All right, so this is all about research flow. Um, like I say, if you're going to walk us through and take us on a journey, you need to show us the pathway. The pathway is your, is your direction of your research essay uh, from beginning to end. And that includes from the introduction all the way to your conclusion, your references, as well as your appendix. Um, the flow must happen. And uh, like I say, if there's too much uh, happening, we will drown in that, in that environment. All right, so tell us where to go, where to swim, uh, and what to look at, all right? So generally, we know this, right? Research, I'm going to review this. You start with the research question, you go into your methodology, what kind of framework you're going to use, and then you go into your data collection, how you're going to collect the data, and then the findings in terms of data description. So some of you, and most, actually most of you, did not do enough data description over here. Um, when I mean data description, it's all about thick description of your work, of what you have done, of your workshop, um, if you're facilitating a workshop with other people, or if you're looking at your own practice, um, not enough data description. And if you did, it went all the way into the appendix. And so um, it didn't add to your argument. All right, and then following that, you go into your data analysis of those findings or, or of those descriptions and then you explain a specific phenomenon using a theory to explain what is happening. All right, and then you end it with limitations of the research, uh, future research implications, and then conclusion leading up to your references. So that's the flow that you should be able to see um, from, from a glance, right? At a glance, I can see this flow. Even if you use these uh, chapter headers or section headers, I should be able to see the flow because this is a standard flow for all academic research writing. Right now, let's take a look at coherence, right? Coherence is about the burger. The burger is, if I'm eating this, I should be able to taste the different components, right? From the patty to the tomatoes, to the, to the cheese or onions and the, and the bread that sandwiches everything. So coherence is about sandwiching the front, the middle and the, the end so that whatever I eat makes sense to me, that I know that I'm eating a burger, right? It's not just something mushy in my, in my, in my mouth, and I don't know what it is. It's just a, 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 an explosion of taste, but I don't really know what I'm eating. So coherence is really finding out what I'm eating, what I'm tasting, and making sure the essay has relevance to, um, to your research question, as well as to your reader. All right, so the flow also happens over here, not just going down from section headers to the end, but it also means moving across sentences, right? Every sentence leading to the next sentence must flow downwards and then from paragraph to paragraph, everything needs to be equally uh, well signposted in that sense. Signposting means telling your reader what to expect in the next paragraph or in the next section. So a little bit of signposting really helps to prepare um, the expectations of your reader. Okay? So that's the cohesion. Cohesion is really the glue um, that links um, your words together. And I'm going to... Uh, define uh, cohesion using uh, a definition from Michael Halliday and Rukhaya Hassan. Uh, these are linguistics uh, professors, and uh, they talk about cohesion um, referring to the relations of meaning that exist within a text. Okay, in other words, cohesion can be defined as linguistic devices that are used to link one part of a text to another. All right, so if you think of it, they are all ties or cohesive ties. This one referring to this one. And then if you go into this one, this one might go to another one. So I'll give an example um, here. All right, so this is an example of cohesion. Um, this is a fictional example just to mm, highlight the point, right? So for this action research project, I decided to work with Clarissa the first thing I immediately noticed about Clarissa's breath work was that her shoulders were as hard as rock. So 
cohesion is taking on a keyword from the previous sentence and trying to repeat it or reiterate it in a different way into the next sentence so that it flows from one sentence to the next. So I'm highlighting this, right? Clarissa, Clarissa is being repeated. And then in this sentence, a new word comes and then it's going to um, bring about the next sentence. All right, it's gonna sound ridiculous, but I want to share this as an example. Okay, so the first thing I immediately noticed about Clarissa's breath work was that her shoulders were as hard as rock. A rock is a solid mineral material exposed on the surface of the ground or under the soil. Older people tend to soil themselves due to a lack of bowel or uh, bowel and or bladder control. Remote controlled cars used to be a thing of the past, but today we have vehicles that fly. They are called drones. In the far distance of the room, the low humming drone from the ceiling, ceiling fan caused me to doze off. Okay, so in a way, this is a ridiculous example, but in a way, this is very cohesive, right? Every keyword is being repeated and it extends and expands into something different, into a new idea. All right, so it is very cohesive, all right? But this example does not make sense because if you take a look, it moves from Clarissa uh, to rocks, to soil, to control, to drone. So it does not make sense and there's no coherence, all right? So this text has strong cohesion, but not coherence. It does not make sense as a whole. As an example of cohesion, this example um, shows you how you should build on keywords or ideas from an earlier sentence to interlink to another new idea, which can then be expanded. This makes your ideas flow better within and across paragraphs. So think of an internal glue for cohesiveness. All right, so cohesion is usually used by writers and readers to create coherence in the text. And, and on the whole, cohesive devices contribute to the text structure, texture, readability, and comprehensibility. All right, so if you are cohesive, generally speaking, it is leading to overall coherence. All right, so let's go through some of these cohesive devices. Um, in academic writing, I'm going to refer to uh, some examples from John Dewey. So reference, okay, so there are about five to five different types of cohesive devices um, that linguists have talked about. They talk about reference, substitution, ellipsis, conjunction, lexical cohesion, uh, which are part of, I mean, which include reiteration and collocation. All right, so I'm going to give an example of uh, each of these different cohesive devices uh, on the right. So a reference basically um, refers to something that is uh, an inf a piece of information from elsewhere. You know, sometimes you want to expand it. So in this case, John Dewey, new information, and then you give a context, right? An important thing of progressive education. So some of us, um, use references in our in-text citations. We talk about this study by um, Dewey or this study by Nicholson, but you didn't really tell us when, who, or who Nicholson is. Right? Give us a bit of context. Nicholson, uh, a professor from Harvard University in psychology. Right? So something like that gives a bit of context and reference so that the reader knows that you're also referring to someone um, with authority. Because if you don't give a bit of that context or the reference, um, it, that person could be someone who had just written a blog, uh, you know, and, and this person may not be a scholar in that way. So, you know, referring to that person's credibility and authority helps to build your argument in terms of its, um, uh, the strength of the argument. All right, number two, substitution. <clears throat> substitution is really the replacement of um, one component to another, you know, just substituting something to, uh, for another. So let me give an example from Alice's experience by John Dewey. An experience has pattern and structure because it is not just doing and undergoing in alternation, but consists of them in relationship. 
To put one's hand in the fire that consumes it is not necessarily to have an experience. The action and its consequence must be joined in perception. Now, this relationship is what gives meaning. And what is this relationship? This relationship has, has been substituted, right? It means the action and consequence joining in perception. This relationship is what gives meaning. To grasp it, to grasp, so it is substituted, right? It refers to the whole action, consequence, and perception. To grasp it is the objective of all intelligence. So Dewey is saying the experience in itself has structure, has pattern, uh, has action and consequence. And at the same time, you need to have some kind of perception, some kind of thinking around it so that the experience is meaningful. And it is also an intelligent uh, kind of uh, experience. All right, so if basically using pronouns like this to grasp it, uh, this relationship is a way to refer to something that was talked about in previous sentences. Ellipsis. Ellipsis just means the omission of a component. So in academic writing, most of the time we do ellipsis by dot, dot, dot. So if you're using quotes from um, scholars, sometimes they write in a very long uh, paragraph and not every sentence or phrase is important. So you want to take away those things that are not important and you just put ellipsis in it. So over here, um, the, you're going to look at this quote. Okay, there's ellipsis happening over here with the dot, dot, dot. I'm going to read you the, the entire a quote by uh, Dewey uh, that has longer phrases, you know, clauses that are not important and that may exceed the word count. So the actual quote is, <clears throat> suppose the artist wishes to portray by means of his medium the emotional state or the enduring character of some person. By the compelling force of his medium, he will, if an artist, that is, if a painter with disciplined respect for his medium, modify the object present to him. All right, so simply put, it's just saying, by the compelling force of this medium, he will modify the object present to him, that is in front of him. The other additional information, you can just uh, put it into ellipsis with square brackets and the three dots. All right, conjunction. There are a lot of conjunctions that we know of, you know. Um, so additive conjunctions are and, likewise, furthermore, in addition, and in some kind of paraphrasing. In other words, all right, so you're just adding to the information. Um, all right, adversative, adversarial conjunctions are opposite ones, right? So you use things like but, however, in contrast, whereas. Causal uh, conjunctions, so, thus, therefore, because, right? So this shows that this leads to this next thing. Temporal conjunctions, right, uh, re relating to time. So in the following chapter, this is like signposting, and those are important uh, conjunctions. In the following chapter, in the following chapter, in the following section, finally, next, at the same time, simultaneously, etc. All right, so lexical cohesion are uh, words that, I think this is more important here, there are many ways of making sure that this is cohesive, your ideas gel together, uh, you repeat. Okay, let me give an example. Dewey rejected the mind as container or brain state. He insisted that the mind, that's repetition here, is activity and interaction between organism and the world. Next sentence. The transactional process means that the organism is undergoing an experience in the environment. All right, so there is the green word interaction is now being replaced. It's a synonym, right? Synonymy here. Uh, words that mean the same thing. So an interaction between organism and the world basically being rephrased and, and the interaction is now the transactional process. It means that the organism is undergoing an experience in the environment. 
experience in the environment is also the same thing in the sentence before organism and the world but with more specificity so this is also related to this specific and general all right so for example okay so next thing perceptions sensing or reflections calculating associating imagining so these are all part of the specific and the general are narrow constructions of human consciousness so some of it could be uh, subsets of larger words so you can use that to explain all right part whole uh, most of the time when you use part whole um, it's best to use the word for example because when you say for example or to illustrate this then you are really expanding um, the idea in part or in, in whole for example we are not trapped in a cave full of illusions rather we engage with a world that may be void or meaning but we engage with it nonetheless it does not make such experiences less real all right antonyms are opposite words words with opposite meanings for example pleasure versus mind body versus um i mean pleasure versus work body versus mind collocations are words that are used um together all right they are used where two words in a text are related uh, like fork and spoon in a general context, right? Uh, where's the fork and spoon? Where's the fork and knife? Um, it exists together, all right? It's a pair of words. So for example, adverse effects, all right? Pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of, of this research study, okay? So this is a good idea if you are really uh, very particular about your language, and I think you should pay more attention to the way you write is to step back and see how you're making all these uh, cohesive devices link from your ideas to the next sentence and then every sentence should flow nicely across and down the paragraphs all right so this is an example of coherence for this project i decided to work with clarissa the first thing i immediately noticed about clarissa's graphic was that her shoulders were as hard as rock even when she breathed in, her shoulders did not move up or down, a phenomenon that can be observed in most people. All right, general to specific, specific to general, uh, there's addition uh, kind of a thing, repetition happening here. All right, explication of rock over here. This resulted, causality, right? This resulted in her voice sounding constricted and her movements limited in range so now you're talking about because you talk about this phenomenon of the shoulders going up and down you want to give more examples to expand and illustrate this all right so this is what we call thick description they're going to the observation you're not just um, uh, describing it in general but you want to be very particular about what you're seeing in in the space she could not focus and she stopped halfway a breathing exercise all right ellipsis happening uh, just for now usually in thick descriptions you extend what you see with what they tell you to see if it co coincides okay it is part of triangulation and i'm going to use this again and again to help you understand that you know triangulation is really to use multiple sources of information to make sure that that description has different entry points is what you observe, what you hear, what you feel, what you're thinking, and then all these things coming together to give it, in a way, a triangle of different points, okay? According to Michael Melnichuk, 2018, a neuroscientist at the Trinity College Institute, this reference here, he says that respiration influences the mind. All right, so this is where you can go into theoretical explanation to back up what you are seeing. He explains, all right, a bit of expl explication here. He explains that the locus coeruleus area in our brain stem produces noradrenaline, a chemical that regulates our focus and attention. Okay, keywords are being ex uh, expanded. Explication of breath and effects of brain and control. When we are stressed, okay, this is almost like, for example, when we are stressed, he adds that we produce too much noradrenaline and so we can't focus, causality. If we are sluggish, 
too little noradrenaline is produced and we can't focus as well. So the word focus is being repeated, right? So there's flow and cohesion happening here. Breathing in on the other hand, all right, um, adversarial kind of cohesive device, uh, increases its production, allowing, allowing us to have a more sustained attention and focus when we need to. Perhaps this is why Clarissa gave up halfway. She was not taking in enough oxygen, probably due to the stiffness of her upper torso. All right, back to her not breathing over here. The shoulders were as hard as rock. And you're repeating and signposting back to something that you mentioned earlier on a few sentences ago. And to some extent, you can see that, you know, there's correlation and closure of your data and most of the time we use perhaps as a form of hedging because you don't want to be very certain because we are most of us are qualitative researchers. We are making correlations. We're not trying to find causality. So we're trying to say, maybe this is what is happening. Perhaps this, is, uh, this explains this phenomenon. But if you see, right, we start with, Cla we start with Clarissa's breath work, uh, shoulders hard as rock. You give a lot of information in the burger and then you end up again at the bottom of your paragraph to say, perhaps this is why she's doing this. There's not enough oxygen. And that's why, uh, uh, I mean, because her shoulders are restricted in movement, there's no oxygen going in and therefore she stopped halfway and the phenomenon is happening. And this is a neuroscientific explanation. Okay, so this allows cohesion to happen within one paragraph. I hope this gives you uh, a clearer idea of how you can bring in the theories into your data finding. All right, this allowed me to modify the next cycle of intervention. So then you can go into the next part of your action research. All right, uh, to see it in a different way, how you can link it. So like I talked about the, the, the sort of the buns and the things that move inside, right? For this project, I decided to work with Clarissa and then you end it. This allowed me to modify the next cycle of intervention. All right, the first thing I immediately noticed about Clarissa's breath work was that her shoulders were as hard as rock. And then you notice, you talk about her hard as rock shoulders, stiffness of her upper torso in the next sentence, closer to the end of your paragraph. Even when she breathed in the shoulders and I move up and down, so this explanation of this, and then you go further in to explain and explicate and give explanations and, and, and basically um, uh, go into more detail, right? He explains this when we are stressed, more examples, breathing in, still part of Michael uh, Malnichuk's um, theory. Okay, so if you're able to visually see this, it is really a, quite a tight, cohesive uh, ideas happening, but with coherence happening in, as a burger, all right? The glue and the burger.